On 2nd of August 1964, the US Navy warship USS Maddox was on patrol off Honmei on the North Vietnamese coast. Suddenly, the Maddox was attacked by a group of North Vietnamese patrol boats. In response to this attack, aircraft were launched from the nearby aircraft carrier USS Ticonderoga and they managed to sink one of the patrol boats. Though the United States already had a military presence in Vietnam for several years, serving in an advisory role, for President Lyndon B. Johnson, this patrol boat attack was the last straw. On 7th of August, the United States Congress passed the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which allowed President Johnson to use military force against communist aggression in Vietnam. After years of increasing tension in the region, the war was now officially on. As it already had a strong presence in the region, the US Navy was tasked with carrying out the first retaliatory strikes against North Vietnam. On board its aircraft carriers, the US Navy had some of the most advanced and deadly combat aircraft in the world. The US Navy's primary fighter at the time was the Vought F-8 Crusader. Armed with both guns and missiles, this sleek looking aircraft was the first American jet fighter to fly in excess of 1,000 miles per hour. However, the F-8 Crusader itself was beginning to be replaced by the McDonnell F-4 Phantom II, a twin-engine fighter jet which would go on to break numerous speed and altitude records of its own. In the ground attack role was the Douglas A-4 Skyhawk. Though not as fast as the F-8 and F-4, this nimble little attack plane could pack a deceptively large punch. And then there was this. The Douglas A-1 Sky Raider, initially called the AD Sky Raider. Compared to the US Navy's jet-powered aircraft in the mid-1960s, the Sky Raider certainly stood out, but not necessarily for the right reasons. It was a slow, portly, and let's face it, somewhat ugly aircraft. An aircraft that was literally designed to fight the Japanese during the Second World War. So, if this aircraft was so outdated, why was it still serving in the US Navy in 1964? How did its performance compare to its more modern jet-powered brethren? Indeed, why did it continue to fly for several more years during the Vietnam War? Before I go any further, quick disclaimer. This video will mainly focus on the Sky Raider in the US Navy, although other services and indeed other nations use this aircraft to great effect. Now, in order to properly understand the Sky Raider's performance in Vietnam, we need to go back and look at its development and service history up until 1964. What we know today as the Douglas A-1 Skyraider has its origins in another Douglas aircraft, the XBTD-1. This aircraft was designed during the Second World War for a Naval Bureau of Aeronautics specification for a new carrier-based attack aircraft. The XBTD-1 had some stiff competition in the form of the Curtis XBTC-1, the Kaiser Fleet Wings XBTK-1, and the Martin XBTM-1, later becoming the AM Mauler. The US Navy had some very complicated designations during this period. However, before Douglas's entry was fully developed, the company's chief engineer, Ed Heinemann, realized that his XBTD-1 wasn't all it was cracked up to be, and in fact was inferior to its rivals. In June 1944, Heinemann met with the Bureau of Aeronautics and proposed that the XBTD-1 be cancelled, allowing the Navy's funds for that aircraft to be diverted towards designing a totally new warplane. To sweeten the deal, Heinemann claimed that the design for his new aircraft would be ready within 30 days. However, not even this was a good enough time frame for the Navy. They demanded that the design be on their desks at 9am the very next morning. Rising up to the challenge, Heinemann and two of his chief designers pulled an all-nighter in their hotel room, and sure enough, at 9am the next morning, they presented the Bureau of Aeronautics with their new design, the XBT-2D-1. The Bureau approved the new design, and in keeping with their track record of tight deadlines, ordered that the first prototype fly within nine months. On 18th of March 1945, two weeks before the nine-month deadline, the XBT-2D-1 had its maiden flight. When testing the aircraft, it was found that it could lift 12,250 kilograms of ordnance. For a bit of context, that was more than the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress heavy bomber could carry. The XBT-2D-1's Wright R3350 radial engine was so powerful that if the pilot increased the throttle too quickly, the resulting torque could make the aircraft spin into either the aircraft carrier's deck or the ocean below it. During its development, this aircraft was given the name Dauntless II in honour of the very well-performing Douglas SBD Dauntless from earlier in the war. However, in early 1946, the name was changed from the BT-2D-1 Dauntless II to the much simpler AD Sky Raider. 
At the end of that year, the Bureau of Aeronautics approved the Sky Raider for service, and in December, VA-19A was the first US Navy squadron to receive these brand new warplanes. In May 1945, the US Navy placed an order for 548 of the new Douglas attack aircraft. However, with the end of hostilities in October of that year, this order was cut down to 377 and then down to 277. Throughout the rest of the 1940s, subsequent versions of the Sky Raider were developed, mainly addressing structural problems. The AD-4 was intended to be the final version, with 550 Sky Raiders having been built in total. However, the late 1940s saw the US military turning their attention away from piston-powered attack aircraft and more towards high-speed jet interceptors and long-range nuclear bombers. Even the new jet fighter bombers were designed with the intention of dropping tactical nuclear weapons. This line of thinking was put on hold with the outbreak of the Korean War. Compared to other Allied aircraft in the Korean War, the Sky Raider performed incredibly well. They would usually carry 3,600 kilograms of ordnance into combat. Now, this was four times what was usually carried by the North American F-51 Mustang and the Vought F-4U Corsair, those being the other two main piston-powered aircraft that the US deployed to Korea. Many types of jet aircraft also saw service in that war. However, the Sky Raiders and Corsairs proved to be much more effective in the ground attack role. Though they lacked the speed of the newer jet fighters, the Sky Raiders and Corsairs could loiter around the target area for much longer, could carry more ordnance, and could operate much closer to the battlefield. However, because so many Sky Raiders were lost over Korea, Douglas had to restart the assembly line, and by the time production of the AD-4 ended in 1952, 1,051 had been built. Because of the Sky Raiders' success in Korea, the US military realised that this type of aircraft could be useful in future conflicts, and so development of a potential replacement aircraft was initiated. However, this replacement was far from the top of the priority list. Rather, the Eisenhower administration mostly relied on a policy of massive retaliation, which was basically using lots and lots of nuclear weapons to repel invading enemy forces. As a result of this policy, the US Air Force and to a lesser extent the US Navy gave priority to developing aircraft that could operate in a nuclear environment. Despite being outclassed by these newer designs, the Sky Raider still kept its place in this environment of massive retaliation, with the AD-4B being designed for the sole purpose of delivering tactical nuclear bombs. The peak of the Sky Raider's service with the US military was in the mid-1950s, equipping 29 US Navy and 13 US Marine Corps squadrons. From here on, the Sky Raider slowly began to be phased out of service. This was despite new developments such as the AD-5, which could perform such duties as electronic warfare, early warning, and even cargo delivery. In 1958, the final Sky Raider left the Douglas production line, this being the AD-7 variant. This brought the total number of Sky Raiders built to 3,180, which is quite impressive considering the Navy's immediate post-war order for only 277. Two years later, the US Marine Corps finally retired the last of their Sky Raiders. However, it should be noted that, even though the Sky Raider was now being phased out, it lasted a lot longer than many of the jet fighters it served alongside during the 1940s and 1950s. Though the late 1950s and early 1960s saw the US military phasing out the Sky Raider, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, this aircraft was starting to come into its own. In 1954, French military forces in their colony of Vietnam were defeated by the Viet Minh insurgent army at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. In the wake of this defeat, the Geneva Accords stated that the newly independent Vietnam would be temporarily divided into North and South zones, which would then be reunited after general elections scheduled for 1956. However, the Eisenhower administration feared that a communist victory in this election would constitute a major regional security threat. It was thus decided that the United States would support the South Vietnamese dictator Ngo Dinh Diem, who subsequently cancelled the upcoming elections. When John F. Kennedy became US President at the end of 1960, he increased material and training support for the South Vietnamese military. Part of this military aid package was a batch of Sky Raiders, but I'll cover their service with the South Vietnamese later on. The United States' first deployment of their own Sky Raiders to Vietnam actually occurred in 1962. Concerned that Viet Cong guerrillas in South Vietnam were being supplied by Soviet-built Antonov AN-2 cargo aircraft, the US Joint Chiefs of Staff ordered that the US Navy and US Air Force choose which of their aircraft would be most suitable to intercept these outdated Soviet biplanes. 
While the US Air Force chose the sleek and supersonic Convair F-102 Delta Dagger, the US Navy chose the AD-5Q Sky Raider, a version of the venerable warplane which had an onboard radar and had proven quite successful in night operations during the Korean War. The Joint Chiefs of Staff ended up choosing the Navy's aircraft over the Air Forces, and three Sky Raiders from VAW-13 were deployed to Tan Son Nut Air Base. However, these aircraft made no actual intercepts of the rumoured AN-2s. The Sky Raider may have outlasted many of the jet fighters that it flew alongside in the 40s and 50s, but by 1964, this piston-powered aircraft was really starting to show its age. Looking at it next to the US Navy's state-of-the-art jet fighters, it looks like it comes from a completely different era of aviation. Well, after all, it literally did come from another era. Looks are one thing, but when comparing different aircraft, it's their performance that really matters. To highlight some of the main differences between the Sky Raider and the US Navy's more modern combat aircraft, I will compare these aircraft based on four performance metrics. Speed, ceiling, range, and payload. The aircraft that will also be compared are the Douglas A4 Skyhawk, which was supposed to replace the Sky Raider, the Vought F8 Crusader, and the McDonnell F4 Phantom II. Something that should come as a surprise to absolutely nobody is that the Sky Raider is by far the slowest. Of course, it is the only piston-powered aircraft on this list. However, given the Sky Raider's role as a ground attack aircraft and not a fighter, being the slowest on this list isn't as much of a disadvantage as you might think, but I'll go into that more later. Once again, the Sky Raider's antique piston engine severely limits its ceiling compared to the other aircraft. In fact, its ceiling of 28,500 feet is just over half of the F-4 Phantom's 54,700 feet. Finally, we have a category where the Sky Raider actually does quite well. Part of this is to do with the Sky Raider's Wright R3350 duplex cyclone radial engine. While early turbojet engines could produce far more thrust than piston engines, their fuel efficiency was terrible. Now, the more fuel efficient an aircraft it is, the further it can fly on a standard unit of fuel. Take the Sky Raider and the F4 Phantom for example. As a rough estimate, the Sky Raider's R3350 engine would consume around 280 kilograms of fuel every hour. Now, compare that to the F4 Phantom, which at cruise speed would consume over 2,700 kilograms of fuel every hour. Indeed, this number would multiply several times when its two General Electric J79 engines engage their afterburners. Now you can understand why the Sky Raider's antique piston engine gave it an advantage over the more modern jets. Of course, this doesn't mean that the jets couldn't fly as far as the Sky Raider, it just meant that they had to pack far more fuel, the weight of which would decrease the aircraft's speed and maneuverability. Once again, the F4 Phantom takes the lead. However, compared to the other two jets, the Sky Raider doesn't perform too badly. Now, at this point, I should note that these figures shouldn't be taken as gospel. For example, earlier on I said that during initial testing, the Sky Raider was found to be capable of lifting 12,250 kilograms of ordnance. However, just because an aircraft can lift a ridiculous payload doesn't mean that it should. The more ordnance an aircraft carries, the harder the engine has to work, thus decreasing the aircraft's top speed, range, and ceiling. Likewise, an aircraft can only achieve its maximum potential speed and altitude if it's carrying minimal fuel and no weapons. This configuration would make the aircraft pretty much useless in combat. Nonetheless, in terms of raw performance, these statistics do give a rough idea of the Sky Raider's strengths and weaknesses compared to its contemporaries. Although, as we have seen, these are mostly weaknesses. However, performance statistics aren't the only thing that has to be considered when comparing combat aircraft. One huge advantage that the Sky Raider had over its jet-powered contemporaries was that it was much cheaper to operate. Also, it had a much longer loiter time than the US Navy's jet aircraft. This longer loiter time made the Sky Raider far more valuable when providing close air support, or CAS, to soldiers fighting on the ground. In fact, the Sky Raider's slower airspeed was often an advantage when providing support for ground forces. According to Scott A. Fedorchak of the US Army, because pilots of CAS aircraft have to visually acquire their targets before attacking to minimise the risk of fratricide, aircraft speed is not the prime requisite. CAS aircraft must also be rugged in order to protect the pilot and aircraft systems from threats encountered in a low-level environment. 
The Sky Raider's slow speed meant that it wouldn't outrun enemy force as it was engaging, and, as mentioned earlier, Sky Raider pilots were able to keep a much better visual track on enemy forces. It was also found that the jet fighter's high speed would often cause the stabilizing fins on their bombs to warp, resulting in the aircraft fluttering in flight. However, despite the Sky Raider's superb cast performance, the jet aircraft had two major advantages. Firstly, they were much faster in getting to the battlefield, and secondly, they were much harder to shoot down. By 1964, the Sky Raider was well on its way to being phased out of US Navy squadrons. For example, let's look at Carrier Air Wing 16, based on the USS Oriskany during the early years of the Vietnam War. This wing comprised of nine squadrons. There were two fighter squadrons, one fighter reconnaissance, one electronic early warning, one helicopter, and four attack squadrons. Of those four attack squadrons, only one was equipped with Sky Raiders. On the 5th of August 1964, three days after the attack on the USS Maddox, the US Navy launched its first Sky Raider attack against North Vietnam. Aircraft from VA-52 Knight Riders attacked a fuel storage depot at the port of Vinh. VA-52 managed to destroy 90% of the depot with no losses. On that same day, Sky Raiders from VA-145 Swordsman attacked a patrol boat base at Hong Gai. However, two of these aircraft were shot down by AAA fire. Though these early combat missions seem promising, it is rather difficult to compare the combat performance of the Sky Raider with that of the US Navy's other aircraft. Even raw statistics themselves are hard to come by, according to John Schleit. It was often impossible to get a clear picture from the air of what these raids accomplished, since the target area was usually obscured by trees, smoke, or darkness. Ground follow-ups were rare. This absence of quantifiable bomb damage assessment allowed for differences of opinion between advocates of propeller aircraft and those who favoured jets. As the Vietnam War ramped up, what was clear was that the Sky Raider was no longer able to carry out the same type of ground attack missions that the jet aircraft could. Sky Raider losses were getting worse thanks to improving North Vietnamese anti-air defences preying on the old aircraft's slow speed. To highlight this, throughout the entirety of the Vietnam War, Sky Raider losses were 1.7 per every 1,000 sorties. This puts the Sky Raider in second place behind the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief's 2.1 losses per 1,000 sorties. Now, keep in mind, the F-105s were responsible for carrying out the most dangerous bombing missions over North Vietnam. Below the Sky Raider, the most commonly lost aircraft were the Grumman A-6 Intruder at 0.9, and the F-8 Crusader and F-4 Phantom at 0.8. Of course, these statistics take into account all of the US military's fixed-wing aircraft during the Vietnam War, not just the US Navy's. However, when it came to being hit by anti-aircraft fire from the ground, it should be noted that the Sky Raider had double the survival rate of the F-105 Thunder Chief, F-100 Super Sabre, and the F-4 Phantom. By 1966, Sky Raiders were flying quite different missions compared to the US Navy's jet aircraft. They could still operate over North Vietnam, but they almost exclusively flew armed reconnaissance missions over lightly defended coastal areas, and Rescue Combat Air Patrol, or RESCAP. They could also fly further inland and attack convoys along the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos and Cambodia, usually armed with rocket pods, free-fall bombs, and parachute flares for night operations. While the task of air-to-air -air combat was given to the US Navy's jet fighters, there were a few cases where the outdated Sky Raiders managed to shoot down enemy jet fighters. For example, on 17th of June 1965, a flight of four Sky Raiders from VA-25 Fist of the Fleet were on their way to perform rescap for a downed US Air Force F-4 Phantom. While on their way to the crash site, the Sky Raiders were intercepted by two North Vietnamese Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-17 fighter jets, and despite their slower speed, they managed to shoot down one of the MiG-17s. In fact, the last ever time in history when a propeller-powered aircraft brought down a jet fighter was on 9th of October 1966 in very similar circumstances, when a Sky Raider from VA-176 Thunderbolts shot down a MiG-17 while flying a rest cap mission. It wasn't just ground attack and the occasional MiG-17 shootdown that Sky Raiders performed over Vietnam. The EA-1F Sky Raider was the US Navy's first electronic jamming aircraft to be deployed in Vietnam. Unfortunately, these aircraft didn't perform particularly well, as they were limited by their outdated vacuum tube technology. Despite their good performance in the armed reconnaissance and rescap roles, as well as a few MiG-17 kills, 
As the Vietnam War went on, it became more and more clear that the Sky Raider needed replacing with the brand new Grumman A6 Intruder and LTV A7 Corsair, the latter being derived from the F8 Crusader. As well as the Sky Raider's old age and inferior performance. Another reason for the US Navy fielding new jet aircraft was that its aircraft carriers would only have to carry kerosene based jet fuel. While operating Sky Raiders alongside jet aircraft, aircraft carriers had to store vast amounts of jet fuel and gasoline for the old piston engines. At long last, the US Navy's final Sky Raider mission was flown on 20th of February 1968, when VA-25, Fist of the Fleet, flew a ground attack mission in support of besieged US Marines at the Khaesan Combat Base. Soon after the US Navy was formally committed to the Vietnam War, it was obvious that the Sky Raider was not able to perform the same types of missions that its jet-powered contemporaries could. Not only did the Sky Raider find its niches during the Vietnam War, but it performed in them incredibly well. In particular, the Sky Raider excelled in the area of rescap. In his book, Bloody 16, the USS Oriskany and Air Wing 16 during the Vietnam War, Author and naval aviation veteran Peter Fay describes numerous rest cap missions where the Sky Raiders proved to be much more effective than the faster jet aircraft. The fact that Sky Raiders were much better suited to rest cap missions shows exactly what that old aircraft's niche was. Flying low and getting involved in gritty, close quarters fighting. While the US Navy's jet fighters were mainly designed to shoot down Soviet high altitude bombers with guided missiles, the Sky Raider was tailor-made to get involved in the aerial equivalent of melee combat. This hardiness was what soldiers on the ground appreciated the most when Sky Raiders came in to provide ground support. That being said, the Sky Raider did have its problems, other than the obvious inferior performance statistics. Though its fuel consumption was much better than that of early jet fighters, the Sky Raider's R3350 engine consumed a huge amount of oil, so much that the aircraft carried a 40 gallon oil tank. An official US Navy record of VA-25's 1967-68 deployment on the USS Midway also gives an interesting insight into some of the Sky Raider's downsides. From the time the first aircraft was completed, pilot comfort complaints commenced. These complaints centred around the reduced head clearance, harness straps between pelvic bones and seat cushion, lack of head support during catapult shots, limited range of travel of shoulder straps, inability to set the compass to correct headings without unstrapping. However, that same document also states that VA-25 Sky Raiders did very well during corrosion control and general maintenance inspections, again owing to the aircraft's ruggedness. As I have touched on previously in this video, it wasn't just the US Navy who used Sky Raiders during the Vietnam War. Years before the United States formally got involved, Sky Raiders from the South Vietnamese Air Force not only attacked Viet Cong forces, but also put down several attempted coups in Saigon. For example, in early 1965, elements of the South Vietnamese army attempted to take control of the government in Saigon. To counter the rebels, Air Marshal Nguyen Cao Khe ordered that his Sky Raiders be sent to fly over rebel positions. After being warned of the Sky Raiders' incredible cast performance, the rebels surrendered, fearing that they would be massacred by these devastating attack planes. Even after the US Navy retired the Sky Raider in 1968, the South Vietnamese Air Force as well as the US Air Force continued to use them. Though they had none based in Vietnam itself after 1967, the US Air Force had Sky Raiders deployed to Nakhon Phanom Air Base in Thailand as part of the 1st Air Commando Squadron. Like the US Navy, the US Air Force used their Sky Raiders for very different missions compared to their own fleet of fighter jets. I should also note that the Air Commandos were equipped with several other piston engine aircraft including the Douglas B-26K Counter Invader and North American T-28 Trojan. In a similar manner to the US Navy, the US Air Force employed their Sky Raiders in the search and rescue role, however they were also used in counterinsurgency or COIN operations. Of course, these Sky Raiders were taking off from airstrips instead of aircraft carrier flight decks, but according to Joseph D. Selesky, Propeller aircraft were found more useful in COIN environments where airfield operations were remote and primitive. They had easier maintenance in austere conditions compared to jet-powered aircraft. Propeller-driven aircraft had both long range and long loiter times, an advantage in coin. Like their Navy counterparts, however, the US Air Force's Sky Raiders were really starting to show their age, and thus were eventually phased out of service. The last US Air Force Sky Raider mission was on November 7th, 1972, when a flight of these venerable old aircraft assisted in rescuing the crew of a downed UH-1 Iroquois helicopter near Quang Tri in South Vietnam. The following year, the last of the US Air Force's Sky Raiders were handed over to the South Vietnamese Air Force. 
Outside of Vietnam, the French used Sky Raiders in a very similar manner to both the US Navy and US Air Force. During the Algerian War, which was an armed anti-colonial struggle just like the French fought in Vietnam, the French used both Sky Raiders and North American T-28 Trojans in counterinsurgency operations. Unlike the jet fighters in the French Armée de l'Air, the Sky Raiders and Trojans could operate from rough, remote airstrips in the desert. Indeed, French doctrine stated that the Armée de l'Air's jet fighters would be stationed in Europe to counter a possible Soviet invasion, while the Sky Raiders and Trojans would remain in Algeria to conduct coin operations. Just like the US in Vietnam, the French Sky Raiders had the huge advantage of long loiter times and ability to operate from underdeveloped airstrips. There are many reasons why the United States lost the Vietnam War. However, in the context of this video, the biggest reason why the communists won is that the United States was fighting the wrong type of war. Since the end of the Second World War in 1945, the US military and indeed the civilian administration had been obsessed with countering the Soviet Union with nuclear weapons and very sophisticated high performance conventional weapons. Though there were elements of the US military that focused on waging insurgent and counterinsurgent warfare, this was far from the top of the administration's priority list. When the United States entered the Vietnam War in 1964, they tried to use their superior firepower to literally beat the North Vietnamese into submission. A good example of this is Operation Rolling Thunder, a large-scale strategic bombing campaign which took place between 1965 and 1968. According to a CIA report, in 1965 the US was spending $6.60 to do $1 worth of damage to North Vietnam. The following year, it was costing the US $9.60. Of course, this three-year-long bombing campaign had little effect on North Vietnamese infrastructure and industry, simply because the country was so unindustrialized. The Sky Raider, and indeed its piston-powered brethren, were an exception to this. Their ruggedness, simplicity, and relative ease to operate in hostile conditions were exactly what the United States needed in Vietnam. As a testament to this, when the US Air Force finally retired the Sky Raider in 1972, it was replaced with the Cessna A-37, an aircraft which had quite a lot in common with its predecessor. Based on the T-37 trainer, the A-37 was slower than most other combat aircraft, despite the fact it was jet-powered. It also had straight wings and could carry a huge amount of ordnance. Like the Sky Raiders before them, the A-37s performed very well in the coin roll. Not only was the A-37 a sign of the Sky Raiders legacy, but so too are aircraft that are flying combat missions in the present day. The two best examples of this are the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II, more commonly known as the Warthog, and the Embraer A-29 Super Tucano. In fact, many of the first leaders of the A-10 program were themselves former Sky Raider pilots. Though the A-10 was originally designed to destroy large numbers of Soviet tanks in Europe in the event of World War III breaking out, a lot of the aircraft's initial design specifications closely matched the Sky Raider's strengths, including survivability, ease of the pilot identifying friendly and enemy ground forces, being relatively cheap to operate, and the ability to loiter over the battlefield. The Embraer A-29 Super Tucano is a more modern design, but it may be even closer in configuration to the Sky Raider. After the war against the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS, the US realized that its allies needed an inexpensive attack aircraft if they wanted to carry out coin operations. State-of-the-art jet fighters like the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II would not be suitable for this kind of warfare. According to Senator John McCain in a defense white paper, the Air Force should embrace a high-slash-low mix of fighter aircraft. Very expensive fifth-generation technology, such as the F-35, is not needed in every scenario. These aircraft could conduct counter-terrorism operations, perform close air support and other missions in permissive environments, and help to seasoned pilots to mitigate the Air Force's fighter pilot shortfall. The A-29 is a turboprop-powered aircraft which is primarily armed with two internal 50 caliber machine guns, but can also carry 20mm gun pods, rocket pods, and general purpose bombs. This is very similar to the loadout that Sky Raiders carried over the Ho Chi Minh Trail back in the 1960s. In 2016, the first A-29s were delivered to the Afghan Air Force to help in that country's fight against Taliban insurgents. From when they entered service up until the Taliban victory in 2021, the A-29 performed exceptionally well in the coin roll. So promising is the A-29 as a coin aircraft that the US government is even considering providing it to other allied states. The fact that the US employed the A-29 in coin operations in Afghanistan, with the possibility of future deployments to Africa and the Middle East, is in fact the ultimate testament to the Sky Raiders' performance in Vietnam. In the present day, the US military has some of the most advanced combat aircraft on Earth at its disposal, 
such as the F-22 Raptor and the F-35 Lightning II. However, while these fifth generation stealth fighters may be able to defeat enemy aircraft with ease, they are the wrong kind of weapons platform to take on a group of unindustrialized and low-tech insurgents. This is why the US government is now taking the A-29 seriously. Likewise, in 1964, the F-8 Crusader and F-4 Phantom's performances were impressive on paper, but they were ill-suited to fighting against the jungle-dwelling Viet Cong guerrillas and North Vietnamese army. This kind of warfare is where the Sky Raider truly excelled, and if the US military's high command had taken more notice of how their ancient piston engine aircraft were performing, then the Vietnam War might have ended a bit differently. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking around to the end of this video. If you want to check out any of the sources that I've used for this documentary, I've put a list of all my references down in the description. There are just a couple of sources I'd like to mention in particular. Bloody 16 by Peter Fay doesn't talk about the Sky Raider specifically, but it does give a pretty good overview of US Navy air operations during the Vietnam War as a whole. Another good one is US Navy Sky Raider Units of the Vietnam War by Rick Burgess and Zip Rouser. Few scale modelers out there, Douglas AD Sky Raider in detail and scale by Bert Kinsey is a really good reference. Speaking of scale models, I'm currently building a, another plastic model of the A1 Sky Raider. I was hoping to release a build video alongside this one, but alas, I've run into a couple of problems with the build, so that video is going to have to wait for a little bit. So once again, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.